Hey, Psych. All right, so we are actually finishing up our cognition unit this week. Um, it's a lot of info in one lesson, so my apologies on that. But we are getting closer and closer to the AP test, and we still have important information to get through. So we are going to start moving a little bit faster, which means a little bit longer um, lessons. However, um, all the information, none of it's too complicated. So hopefully you find it even a little bit interesting and it shouldn't be too awful of an assignment. So you should have opened the slides and um, also the assignment. Again, it looks a little bit long. Most of it is just notes though. Um, and then there are some small activities. So today you're gonna to be going through, there's a do now, there's some announcements I'm gonna go over, um, notes and activities, and then a summative assessment. So just a few announcements. Um, you should now know that there are no live classes this week. Um, so you will not be able to come to class at 10 a.m. on Thursday. But if you would like to hear me go through the terms and concepts, well, you're doing so right now because you're listening to this. Um, this assignment is due no later than next Thursday, May 6th. I would recommend getting it done before because next Thursday you will get another new assignment that'll be pretty long as well. So I would try to have it done maybe by Wednesday, May 5th if I was uh, trying to get it done earlier, but you have until the sixth technically. Um, also, I mentioned this last week, but I will not be teaching next Thursday and Friday, which doesn't really matter to you, but I will not be having another live class next Thursday because I will be out of town. So um, instead, your lesson will be pretty much kind of like this one today. I'll record a lecture and post uh, the assignment the night before though, not as early as I did this week. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit, but these last few units, we are going to move really fast. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of information and um, it's it might seem a little hectic, but we wanna try to get through as much of it as we can before that AP test, which is on June 3rd. Additionally, you'll see that I'll include review activities in every lesson moving forward. So you can start prepping for the AP test if you're one of those people that uh, likes to be proactive and get ready sooner than later. All right, um, so that's it for announcements. If you always have questions, you can reach out to me via text or email and I'm happy to help. So the do now um, is at the top of the page and you're basically just trying to write as many things as you can remember from one day ago, one week ago, and one year ago. After doing this, you'll probably like see that you probably remember more things that you did a day ago than you did a year ago um, or even a week ago. And that's just because we can't possibly remember every single piece of information that we learn because some of it's not as interesting. Some of it isn't as relevant to our life and some of it, it, it kind of gets lost. So what we're gonna be looking at today to start this lesson is memory loss or memory interference, things that get in the way of us remembering things. So we're gonna start with some notes on that. So the first two terms we have here are um, different types of amnesia. Amnesia is basically just kind of a fancy word for memory loss, right? So anterograde amnesia means when you can recall the past, but you can't recall any new memories. So there's something that has interfered with your um, memory. So you have some sort of brain damage in which you can't recall memories from a long time ago, or sorry, you can recall memories from a long time ago, but not from recently. So this is anterograde amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is when you can recall recent memories, but not your past memories. The way I remember the difference between these two is because retro means like old, like if you say something's retro, it means it's kind of older. And when I think of that, I think of like, oh, so you can't remember the old stuff. It's so retro that you can't remember it. So those are the different types of amnesia. And again, you are writing your notes here. Um, then there's also different types of interference, and it's pretty similar. Um, so we have proactive and then retroactive interference. Proactive interference basically means there is some sort of interference and it's proactive, and it occurs when prior learning disrupts recall of new info. It means you've learned something already, and you're trying to remember new information, but you keep thinking of the old thing that you know and you keep coming back to that so it prevents you from learning this new info so it's interfering with your memory so it's not like you've lost it it's just not helping you remember it then on retroactive this on the other hand occurs when prior learning disrupts recall of old information so it means like something that you're learning disrupts your ability to recall 
something that happened a long time ago. So again, retro means long time. So that's the difference between those two. There's some other things that um, impact our memory as well. So the first is repression. Repression is the action or process of suppressing a thought or desire in oneself so that remains unconscious. The way I think of repression is, we actually talked about this when we talked about Freud. He says that we have a lot of these like repressed feelings and thoughts that maybe we only see in our dreams. Um, repression is like, usually a lot of times it's when something um, something bad maybe happens and you don't want to remember it and you, you consciously kind of put it further back in your brain so you don't remember it. So it's unconscious back there. Some things might trigger it. Um, we think about like PTSD, right? Um, a lot of people you'll say like you fought in war and you actively want to repress those memories. You don't want to think about it. You're like, no, I don't want to think about that. I'm going to keep moving forward. But something triggers it potentially and it would bring that out of the unconscious. But repression is a tactic that a lot of people employ. Um, sometimes you can do it consciously. Sometimes it maybe just happens. Um, that can impact your ability to remember things. Then we have the misinformation effect. Um, this happens when a person's recall of episodic memories becomes less accurate because of post-event information. So it means you went through something, something happened, but then you get new information after this thing that happens, and that interferes with your remembering of what actually happened. So this would be like, let's say you were involved you saw a crime happen. Let's so see, you say um, somebody robs a bodega. You're in the bodega and um, you see something happen and you remember what happens and you report it to the police um, when they come to question you. Let's say they call you in a second time though and they're like, hey, we got some new information about this and they tell you all this new info, but you hadn't, that's not something that you remember, but now it interferes with what you actually experienced. And now you have a little bit less of an accurate understanding of what you actually went through and you're now more influenced by this new information um, that you've gotten. Um, so that would be a misinformation effect. And then we have source amnesia. And that is the ability to remember where, when, or how, the, sorry, the inability to remember where, when, or how previously learned information has been acquired while retaining the factual knowledge. This one I feel like happens to me more than, often than it should. Um, maybe this is just a, a thing with getting older, but it basically is saying like, you know something, you're like, yeah, I, I know this specific fact or something. And people are like, oh, well, where'd you learn that? And you're like, I, I don't know. And you're like, you can't remember where you were or when it was. Uh, maybe you remember later, but for a long time, you're like, I really just, I have no idea. It means you can't remember the source of it. You are forgetting the source of that information. So that'd be source amnesia. One last term to go over in terms of memory loss and interference is deja vu. Um, deja vu is something I think many people, if not all of us have experienced. Um, sometimes you just feel like, whoa, I feel like this has happened already. And that's what deja vu is. It's this, it means deja vu is a French term. It means already seen. And there's not a ton of science behind deja vu as a phenomenon, but it does impact your, it, it messes up your way that you remember something. You're like, man, I remember this already happened. Um, then this is what happens. And it just kind of fogs your memory. So there's an interesting story here. Um, so watch that. Um, and But that is it for memory loss and interference. So now we're going to move on to the next chunk, um, which is cognitive methods for solving problems. So um, a lot of, we've already kind of talked about ways to help us remember things. Um, and these are just kind of some more problem solving methods. So um, first, we're going to look at algorithm. Wow, I can't talk algorithms, heuristics, and insight. And then you're going to look a little bit more into some other things. So algorithms are probably a, ter it's probably a term that you've learned maybe in a math class, but an algorithm is a methodical, logical rule or procedure that guarantees solving a particular problem. It's why in math, you know, they, they teach you the algorithm, they teach you the formula before you start practicing doing all these different problems. That way you have this formula, you can plug it in and get the answer very quickly. It helps you um, solve these problems more quickly than if you didn't have that, that formula. 
Um, heuristics are a simple thinking strategy that allows us to make judgments and solve problems efficiently. And we'll get into heuristics a little bit more um, in the next few slides. And then um, insight, which is a sudden realization of a problem solution. This one isn't very scientific. It's more just kind of like, oh, I know what to do. Um, and I think we all kind of go through this, but um, it is one way that helps us solve problems. So before you go on to the next set of notes, there is a stop here. Um, and it is going to be relevant to the next chunk of notes that you're going to take. So it says New York City is the dirtiest city in the United States. So you'd write three examples that confirm this statement, basically. So if I were writing this, I was writing my examples, I would probably say one example is um, literally every single time I take my dogs out for a walk, they eat so much trash on the streets. They constantly are eating chicken wing bones everywhere. Uh, that'll be one. Two, um, I could say just the amount of rats that we have in the city. Um, the fact that we have so many rats and they're able to survive without, you know, like an owner feeding them means that they're clearly getting fed by all the trash in the city. Um, and two or three, I would say a lot of times there's just like this is really gross, but like I've walked around and just see like gunk in the streets, like this like slimy kind of one time I was walking to school in the Bronx. And I just saw like green slime in the streets. I don't know. It's just a really gross experience. So anyways, I have lots of memories that um, confirm that this is true, um, I, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we are now going to kind of think about this and kind of think about how this applies to this term confirmation bias. So. Confirmation bias is a tendency to search for information that supports our preconceptions and to ignore or modify contradictory evidence. So let's say I really believe New York is the dirtiest place. I because my experiences show that New York is exceptionally dirty and I've been to other cities that are way cleaner than New York City is. So I have a bias. I, my bias is that I think New York is disgustingly dirty. Um, but let's say I get some information that says New York is one of the cleanest cities in the world. And I'm like, what? No, that's not true. I'm going to probably hold on to my bias. And additionally, I'm going to keep searching for information that supports my bias. We do this a lot. Um, sometimes it's, you know, it's not super harmful. Like if you think a certain food is the best kind of food, and you're like, well, I've had it here and I've had it here and I've made it and I've done it. Like, you can find everything to support your bias because you think it is. But it can also be harmful in the sense that um, specifically in terms of like the media, right, in terms of political ideas and things like that. If you have a certain bias towards something and you are only looking for information that supports it, you're potentially missing out on other facts that could be true or that are um, that go against that bias. And this is what we're seeing a lot in today's world, that we're seeing people who are actively only reading or watching things that support their point of view rather than trying to get like the actual factual information. So confirmation bias, um, that's kind of what that is. Then another thing that can be a barrier to our problem solving. So this is the, sorry, I should have said that earlier. These are barriers to problem solving, meaning they are preventing us from getting to maybe the most complete and accurate answer. Additionally, we have mental set. And this is our, we've talked about this before a little bit, uh, but it's a tendency to approach a problem in one particular way, often a way that was successful in the past. Um, we've actually, we haven't talked about this before. I was thinking perceptual set, my apologies. So it's basically saying like, oh, I've done this so many times, I'm just gonna keep doing it the way I do it. And probably because it's probably worked for you so many ways in the past, but let's say you get to that one time and it doesn't work, it could prevent you from actually solving the problem be like, Ugh, why isn't this working? This is this is stupid. And then you give up. Um, so your mental set, your way you've approached things, and your experience with that in the past can interfere with your ability to solve new problems. So um, there's another kind of check in here. One, you had to write an example of confirmation bias in your own life. And then there were um, just a couple questions about thinking about following intuition and how that can be a good or a bad thing. Then there is just a reading here that gets a little bit more into heuristics and a couple other things that influence our judgments and decisions we make. So the first is a representative heuristic. 
And basically what this is, it says to judge the likelihood of things in terms of how well they represent particular prototypes is the representative heuristic. So it gives you a, um, an example. It says, a stranger tells you about a person who is short, slim, and likes to read poetry, and then asks you to guess what this person is more likely to be a professor of classics at an Ivy League university or a truck driver. Because when we think of somebody who is short, small, reads poetry, maybe has like glasses on, wears like sweater vest, I'm automatically thinking of a professor, right? That's just my, my, it, represents a prototype, this idealized vision of what that looks like, probably because I've seen that in movies, TV, or even I had professors like that. But that doesn't mean that that person couldn't be a truck driver, right? So this, this helps us make a quick snap judgment, which can be good in some cases, but um, it also can lead us to ignore relevant information. It can also lead us to be a little bit stereotypical in our way um, of thinking. So that's the representative heuristic. So basically it's, we're using previous rep things that represent like the best version of it or what the, the stereotypical version of it is. The availability heuristic is a little bit different. Um, this works when we estimate the likelihood of events based on how mentally available they are. The availability heuristic can lead us astray in our judgments of other people. Um, so this would be like, for example, here's one. Um, if somebody from a particular ethnic or religious group commits a terrorist act, as happened on September 11, 2001, um, we are readily available memory of the dramatic event may shape our impression of the whole group. So that's why, because obviously you all weren't alive when this happened, which is crazy, but um, there are a lot of people that still to this day, unfortunately, they think all Muslims are terrorists, right? Because they have this availability, this available information in their head that said on September 11th, this incredibly large event in US history, recent US history, in which Islamic terrorists um, did kill thousands of people. Um, that they That was their impression of this and that therefore when they saw other Muslims, they immediately go to that quick, like it was so available to them because it happened so recently because it was something that was so uh, vivid that they began to think that this is something that all of them do. So this isn't a really extreme example, but um, this is, it just, um, it can influence our opinions on people, but it can also influence our decision to do something. So for example, um, another example, I kind of have it here, but let's say recently there was a plane crash or actually even a better one. I'm thinking, I remember last year, um, early 2020 when Kobe died in the helicopter crash, right? Immediately after that, I was like, no way am I going in a helicopter or, or like, I was like, I was so afraid because I automatically, because of what just happened, I was thinking consistently about how dangerous helicopters were. And I kept, then I was also trying to find more info that said helicopters were dangerous. So I was confirming my bias, but that was the first thing I thought of because that had happened so recently. Next is overconfidence. And we have talked about this. This was also um, a barrier to um, psychological, like, um, reasoning earlier that we talked about in the beginning of the year, but sometimes uh, our judgment and decisions can can uh, not be the best because we're more confident than correct. Um, we might think we know something um, because we're like, we're the best and then you do it and it doesn't happen. Um, it says history is full of leaders who do this. Um, good example would be Napoleon or Hitler, right? They thought, man, we are on top of the world right now. I'm conquering, I'm conquering. They think they can take over Russia in the dead of winter. And clearly they can't. Like they should have looked at the facts that Russia is ginormous and it's freezing in the winter. Your troops aren't gonna survive. Next we have belief pers perseverance, um, which is our tendency to cling on to our beliefs in the face of contrary evidence. Um, so you have like a really intense belief about something and you get new information and you're like, no, 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 that's not true. No, no, no. You want to cling on to your belief despite maybe getting the other information. Even if you do accept it as true, you're like, oh, I still, I still like this person. I don't know. They can't be that bad. And then framing. Um, framing is the way we present an issue and it sways our decisions and judgments. Um, this would be, okay, so here's a good example. It says, imagine two surgeons explaining a surgery. One tells patients that 10% of people die during the surgery. The other says 90% of people survive. 
it's the same information, but the way you say it is different. If I like, I mean, I can rationalize, but like immediately if you hear 90% of people live, it's totally fine. You're like, okay, yeah, then you said that's an A. But you hear 10% of people die, you're like, oh my God, that could be me. Um, despite them being the same, the effect is not. So typically they found like in surveys that people said that they're more fearful of the 10% are going to die than if they heard 90% survive. Framing can be really powerful. Um, that's why like the way that you see news articles, like the headlines that are written, or um, when you're taking a survey or a quiz or something, the way the question is framed, um, this can all influence your judgment, everything like that. So that's more information about these. Um, barriers to judgment decision making and or effects on it. And then there's just a couple of um, reflection questions here. Okay, we're oh, we're getting closer. So next we're moving on to thinking and language. And this is a shorter little chunk, but it does come up often on the AP test. So I did want to go over the few things about this. So language is, I think we all know it is, but it's our spoken, written or signed um, words and the way we combine them to communicate meaning. So there's a lot of things that make up language though, right? There's there's writing, there's reading, there's listening, there's speaking, there, there's, you know, you have to think about how you're, there's so many things going on with it, but language tells us so much. Um, and the way language is structured also conveys meaning. So there's a, language is kind of broken into different, dif different structures. So first we have phonemes. Phonemes are the smallest distinctive sound units in the language. Um, so you don't have to write this, but to just show you what that means. So basically to say the word bat, um, the, there are three phonemes in bat. B, A, T. Those are all the small distinctive sound units. B, A, and T all make different sounds. B, A, T. Put that together, you have three phonemes. Morphemes are a little bit different. Morphemes are the small students that carry meaning in a given language. So with P, at, none of those things convey meaning really. Well, I guess A could, like it's a possessive thing, um, but P, T, don't. There's no meaning to that other than it's the letter B and the letter T, right? A morpheme is a little bit different. So for example, if you have the word danced, there's two morphemes in danced. You have dance, dances, you know, there's a definition to the word dance. There's some sort of meaning to that. But also when you add a D at the end of dance, that does convey meaning. That D means it happened in the past, right? So you could also, if this word was dancing, it would also have two morphemes, dance and ing, meaning you're currently dancing. Same with dance is. The S would be you're, you're also dance. It's also happening. <laughs> so that's the difference between those two. And then um, finally, we have grammar, a word that you've probably heard too many times and hate, but um, grammar is the system of rules that enables us to communicate with one another. These rules guide us in deriving meaning from sounds, which is semantics, and in ordering words into sentences, syntax. So that's it on language. There were a couple notes there. The last thing is cognition and creativity. So this is all on this page. Um, there's no notes on this actually. Um, so obviously this whole unit is about cognition and cognition is everything around thinking, knowing, remembering, communicating, memory, whatever. Um, and one way our brain helps us think, know, remember, communicate is by forming concepts. When we know these larger concepts, it helps us make sense of things. So concepts are mental groupings of similar objects, events, ideas, and people. So for example, the concept chair includes many items. You could say baby's high chair, reclining chair, dentist chair, all of which are for sitting. Um, concepts simplify our thinking. And if we didn't have them, we would need a name for every, every different thing. Like, chair. We can just say, oh yeah, go sit in the chair. Instead of like, I mean, you could say go sit in the dentist chair or go sit in the, the armchair. And we have all those things, but chair is like a broader concept. So you'll define the terms here. And then you are going to create, you're going to just do an example of your own concept, kind of like chart, I guess. So for example, my concept was, I said 2000s Disney Channel shows. And then I wrote down five different things that go into my concept. But if I was just talking to friends and be like, oh my gosh, yeah, I love the 2000s Disney shows. And um, they'd be like, yeah, yeah, me too. And like, hopefully we're all, because my friends grew up during that time, we're all thinking of kind of the same things. We're thinking of these shows that are listed there. 
Um, concepts are often developed um, from prototypes. And I mentioned this term earlier, but a prototype is just a mental image or best example of a category. So um, for example, like a robin is a better prototype than a penguin. Like even though we know a penguin is a bird, like when I think of birds, I don't think of a penguin because penguins don't fly, right? When you think of birds, it's a robin is a more bird-like bird or like a, I don't know, a cardinal, a blue jay, something like that. Um, a pigeon, I guess, if we're here. Um, so that's what a prototype is. It's kind of like the like kind of the prototype of that. So sometimes um, when something doesn't match our prototype, we can get kind of like, we can get a little bit confused about it. So for example, like a tomato, it is a fruit, right? But like when I think of fruit, I think of strawberries, I think of apples, bananas, things that I would eat for breakfast or things that are in desserts. Tomatoes aren't that, like tomatoes are in sauces, tomatoes are on a salad, tomatoes are like, yeah, they're, there's not, they're not sweet in the same way that it is. So that makes it hard for us to categorize it into it like as a concept, right? So um, you will describe something that doesn't fit a particular prototype of concept. So kind of like I just did with tomatoes. So something that doesn't quite fit into a, the prototype of what it could be. Finally, the last part of this today is creativity. Um, so you're going to first kind of think about uh, there's different types of thinking. There's convergent and divergent thinking. Convergent means thinking that allows you to give the correct type of answer. Well, divergent means kind of going against that. And it's used to generate more creative ideas and more creative solutions. So um, you're going to kind of think of different test questions that would be testing convergent and divergent thinking. And then um, it just goes a little bit into what are the components of creativity and how to boost creativity. Um, so the components of creativity are expertise. To be really creative in something, you have to like know it really well. Um, you have to have imaginative thinking skills, kind of be able to think outside the box, make some connections, go beyond what is just normally seen. To have a venturesome personality it means you're willing to kind of take a risk, to be okay with uncertainty, to um, know that you can work through different obstacles, things like that. You need to have intrinsic motivation. I mean, you are internally driven. You're driven by this desire to want to learn, to, to do more, not by extrinsic motivators, which would be like meeting a deadline, making money, things like that. And then a creative environment. When you're surrounded by other people or you're in a space that feeds creativity, it's going to be easier to be creative. Um, so then it just goes into a little bit of things that can help you be creative. If you're interested, read those. And the last part of today's lesson is since this is kind of a wrap up of everything in um, this unit, there is some multiple choice. Some of it, most of it goes over what you learned today, but there are a few questions that go over what you learned in the previous or even the first lesson around this unit. So I know that this is a lot of info. Um, I hope this video helped explain it a little bit, but if you ever need help on anything, just feel free to email or text me and I'm there for you.